as a leader at the moment, or perhaps you don't see anybody? For Romania. For Romania. Yeah, we're just kind of on the front number one line at the moment. <coughs> Who do we... Maybe uh, we see some of our business leaders as perhaps more admirable, more visionary than the political leaders. We might even see some leaders of professional bodies. You know, some perhaps leaders who are lawyers or doctors or something like this. Perhaps we admire them. So we're kind of still thinking about who we might admire at the moment. Yep, no, there's a second. Yep. It is the truth, you know. Charisma, <laughs> maybe. Oh, he's maybe, but not. He needs to have also a um, uh, very good background about uh, career, like a real career. Like, like he actually built something in his life professionally. I mean, he needs all of this. He needs also to make it good to the public, you know, to convince them, yeah, I'm going to. Good things to you. Okay, there's lots of things in what you've said, so let me try and share this with everybody. Um, our friend here is talking about he. <laughs> Actually, there are lots of leaders um, now that are not he's anymore. He's. Yeah, but also um, corporate leaders, um, government leaders. I mean, in Germany, um, so in Scandinavia. In Britain, we had Mrs. Thatcher for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Double H saw it there, but um, you also mentioned have to have to have a career. Like one of the criticisms of the current politicians in UK is that some of them have just been politicians all their lives and never done anything, <laughs> and that they haven't achieved something. So I think that's what you're looking for: somebody you can admire, look up to, having done something. <laughs> Oh, Virgin. Oh, yeah, Richard Brand's son. Yeah. Well, he's done something. He's still for business. Uh, Brand's not going to mention, actually, Richard Brand's son from Virgin Group. And his idea at the beginning was to have a company whose name would shock people. It would shock your grandmother. <laughs> and it was like a young image company. And it's come a long way over quite a long period of time. So you're thinking about somebody with vision. Um, I think you had a third point. Um, sorry, what was your you had a third point? Something like um, charisma. Okay, we're going to cover all these things. We're going to talk about all these things. It has to be a role model. Role model. Okay, somebody that uh, people can look up to because they've done something that they admire. Okay. Well, just to build something important. I, in our country, we have a, a very good example. I don't know if you heard about uh, Marian Kozma. It was a leader of a uh, 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 worker <coughs> in uh, yeah, the local workers uh, and actually uh, he was a bad example but was a leader because came with all the the workers in uh, in bucharest and oh, made yes. the revolution of the 1991 or a big hit actually oh, okay. it's, it's not, yeah. and it, it was a leader he was uh, um, the, the leader of the syndicate at the beginning he prospered the local area, and after that he just jumped. And uh, okay. has a good environment. So he kind of came from nowhere and um, exactly. ended up no, in no career, well, no yeah. intelligent person, no. <laughs> just charisma. the moment, and, yeah, charisma and the... Uh, uh, okay, so that helps answer the question about where as well, where this person might come from. Yeah. We come from a, a workers' group or union or something like yeah. this. Do you have a point? Yes, um, I think everybody is trying to focus on the qualities of the leader, but to me, the biggest quality of the leader is making me become someone else. So I think the biggest thing a leader sh should have is making me change in some way in which... So the change in me is more important than his... Uh, so the leader is kind of transformational. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you heard this word, um, uh, alchemy? Alchemist. Yeah. What's an alchemist? 
person who claims to transform uh, every single metal gold. in gold. <laughs> yes, somebody who changes base metal into gold. Yeah. And this is a nice image for transformation. To take something very boring and ordinary, a piece of iron or something, and make it into gold. And there's a, a theory of leadership which I would recommend to you, which talks about the alchemist leader. This is somebody who not just transforms you know, the immediate people, um, and not just an organization, but a whole society. And some of the most famous examples are Nelson Mandela, and the Mahatma Gandhi, people who change the whole society. Positive ones. Hitler is also one. Hitler, well, you see, because leaders um, can be good or bad. And, you know, leadership, giving, investing lots of power in a leader is kind of playing with fire. Because Hitler, Saddam Hussein, uh, Colonel Gaddafi, <coughs> I mean, these are, these are charismatic, inspirational people with a mission and a cause and all these good things. And maybe even Mugabe. You know, these people who kind of have been hanging in there and not leaving. And this is what's been happening over the last few months that we've been watching with great interest in the media, is all these leaders who've been hanging out for like 30, 40 years, being toppled by their uh, populations. Of course, it's not as easy um, everywhere that it was in Egypt. In fact, the Egyptians are very proud of themselves because they did it. Lots of other people want to do it, but can't do it in the way that they did. Or maybe Mubarak was smart. He realized that if he was one of the first leaders to go, he could have all his goodies you know, stashed away in the Swiss bank account, so he could still get those goodies. Because now, all these regimes where these leaders are being threatened, they're, all their investments are all being frozen. So that's one, left. one thing we should think about is leaders have to know when to stop. Because if they go on wrong forever, because sometimes leaders, first time they get into power, first thing they do is change the constitution so they can be leader forever. <laughs> Some leader. That's kind of a scary thing to do. <clears throat> yes. People leader has to have a vision at one point to uh, fulfill it and step back to get the crazy thing to power and uh, control people. Absolute. No, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. <coughs> It's a very well-known quotation. But leadership and power are very closely intertwined. And it's like a drug. It's like a kind of obsession. So lots of leaders don't want to stop. So you need to have a robust constitution so that you can stop people being a leader forever and kind of turning sour, turning bad, and no longer being the kind of positive leader you thought you had to start with. But this is up to the people who put this leader in. And we had a um, visitor where I live uh, giving a lecture about um, you know, the problems of Mugabe being in control of Zimbabwe. And people in the audience said, why doesn't somebody just bump him off? You know, just assassinate him. And then all the problems would be over. But we actually know that they wouldn't be. Same in Libya. We can't just get rid of Gaddafi and then the problems would be over. It's more than that because people who become very powerful as leaders surround themselves with coterie as a network of people who then depend on them, a bit like the tree with all the bugs in it. And they defend their leader because the leader legitimizes them. So that, that's one of the reasons why these leaders carry on. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough from historically in ancient times when leaders were actually killed and that meant the destruction of the power they promoted. So for example, Caesar or Alexander. So the solution may sound radical for nowadays, but uh, uh, history has proven that it may be a solution. Maybe a solution, but also their followers were kind of weeded out. And if you think about leaders who are trying not to ever be deposed, who are trying to hang in there forever, people like Chairman Mao and Stalin, mm -hmm. they had purges and, and the Cultural Revolution. And the whole idea that, and, and Hitler had the Night of the Long Knives. 
The whole idea of that was to get rid of any competition. So, because they studied the way that leaders lost power, there was somebody else came up and challenged them. So you try to spot all your challenges and get rid of them. And this is another way in which these leaders can be perpetuated. Yeah, that's why challenges because also afraid to have some ventilation system in the people's house. He was <laughs> so upset that somebody got a gas poison him, so he did all the possible not to have gas uh, air coming out. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, of course, there are leaders who have um, impersonators, aren't there? Who yeah. won't do all the public things so that they're not assassinated or shot or something. And Stalin had also uh, the same problem. He lost his mind. He, he saw that everybody uh, tries to, to kill himself with, uh, with his food. The uh, yeah. same problems. Oh, so uh, maybe physical. this is like the, ancient, the kings mm -hmm. of ancient times. Yeah. They had food tasters. Yeah. All their, the, their food was served on silver plates so that you could see any poison. It would go black. Okay, this is all kind of um, obsession, uh, you know, crazy behavior. Brutus and Sansa, which we try to avoid. It's still available, I think, in the royal kingdom. In the UK, they are now. It's seafood. Because of the poison. It's forbidden to serve since, I don't know, 50 years, they said. I don't really know if that's true. But I know when they're traveling, um, they all send out their menus ahead of time and people who are catering for them when they visit another country give them certain food. But I think it's just because that's what they like. But, um, oh, it was really funny because um, somebody was challenging Gaddafi on why he's been in power for so long and it's wrong. And he said, but the Queen of England's been in power for longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> It's right, but a little bit different kind of way of operating. But anyway, um, so we've talked a little bit about um, Romania's situation. Let's just, we don't need to answer the question, but I'd like to think for yourself about your organization. Okay, so um, what kind of leader does your organization need? What's your definition of leadership? And some organizations like everybody to be a leader. And encourage empowerment. Everybody being a, a, perhaps a supervisor or even somebody who is supervised <coughs> being a leader in their own way. So this is a revolutionary concept perhaps. The idea that leaders don't necessarily have followers. They might just be a leader in what they do. Leadership is not necessarily um, practiced by a person. It might be a process. And the way an organization might be a leader in its own area. So the whole organization is a leader. So I'm kind of encouraging you to think of leadership in the broadest way. So not as just a person with followers. It can be a process of leading people by a group. Or leading people by themselves. Um, Self-managing teams. Not always very successful. There is a kind of tendency for people to want to have a leader. But some people are kind of pushed into leadership roles because people around them want a leader. And not everybody wants to be a leader. Leaders have sleepless nights. You know, leaders can, can get paid more, but have a lot of responsibility. Leaders can get fired more. You know, if you're not a leader, you make no decisions, and you're very, you might be very safe in your job, but you're not going to take on that leadership role. So our organization, what kind of leader, why do we need a leader right now, and what particular purposes, who is going to be the leader, and do we have succession planning, or do we recruit leaders from outside? Some organizations <laughs> like to grow their own leaders, and some well-known international companies like uh, HSBC, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, they hire people straight from college, straight from school even, and they have all these leadership training initiatives. Other companies try to steal their people. And for many years I worked as a headhunter, and we just, we stole people from these companies that grew their own talent. 
it's quite difficult to get them out sometimes. But there are, there are other companies who like to take shortcuts. They would rather hire somebody who's up and running, hit the ground running, get on with the job, rather than all this lengthy process of development. Of course, if you're a brand new company and a startup, you can't spend five years training a leader. You've got to find somebody from somewhere else. And, you know, some countries also have leaders from other play, other countries. I mean, I spent January in Peru teaching for Maastricht School of Management. And in Peru, you would have read about their recent elections. And there's this, this lady who's a Japanese who stood. And she was um, the daughter of a chap who became a uh, president of Peru, who was, who was a Japanese. You might think, why would the Peruvians vote for a Japanese? Of course, there's another element there, which is these family dynasties or dynasties. You know, like with the Bushes, George W. Bush and George Bush Sr. And, you know, and, you know like the, the Gandhis in India, these families. Okay, they're not royalty, but they, they've got this kind of family succession going. And, you know, would we be happy with that or, or not? Especially in an organization. That's not even like a family organization, but it could be like, are there, are there families that produce leaders? <coughs> There's one of the big questions of leadership is always, are leaders born or made? You know, do some families just grow them? Or, you know, do organizations grow them? Or can you be an ordinary person with no, no leadership competencies, apparently, and be made into a leader? Of course, we have to believe that you can make leaders, because otherwise we wouldn't have a job. But, but certainly, there are some people who've got massive leadership potential, even as a little kid. And people like Richard Branson, whose name was mentioned already, I mean, even when he's like, six years old, you know, at school. He's kind of running the school um, snack shop, you know, running the marbles, you know, little game with the balls contest. You know, he's got leadership potential already coming out at a very young age. There are other people who become leaders much later in life, in a different style. But there's not just one kind, there are many, many kinds. Okay, we can also think about our own professional career and ask these, um, these questions. What kind of leader would we like to be? Um, why do we need, you know, what kind of leadership kind of lead situation would I like to go in for? Um, you know, who do I admire as a leader, personally? And, you know, where is leadership to be found? In amongst the community that I know. And is leadership often the product of a very difficult situation? So in wars, we always get leaders emerging, which is our historical context. And there's kind of strong people who are needed. But they don't always, they're not always the best person to lead a peaceful situation. And like in Britain, in, after the Second World War, uh, Winston Churchill, who was leading Britain through that period, um, lost his job as Prime Minister after the war. And some people said, oh, how awful to kick out somebody so successful. But he was regarded as a war leader, so therefore better to have a new guy for the peace. Now, he, he kind of stepped down and he was voted out, but not everybody must be voted out. Okay. So, um, are we sufficiently warmed up to now do the eight questions of leadership. Okay, because we'll need the time. Okay, now this book that you've got the cover of with you um, is called Leadership Key Concepts. And it's a series of opposites. And the publisher said, oh, it's a dialectic of leadership. Oh, that sounds a bit uh, communist. But anyway, um, each, each concept is a balance of extremes. So it's not just, so we don't have, in this book is not just 34 concepts of leadership, it's 34 pairs of concepts. 
And the eight that I've picked out, I could have picked out any another eight, you'll see have got a balance. And what I'd like to impress upon you right from the beginning is that this balance is not good and bad. And lots of students ask me, well, Dr. Jones, which one is good? No, it's not good, it's just different. And leadership is quite situational, as I've tried to indicate already. And it's also about you and your personality. So I don't recommend anybody to try to be a kind of leader that they're not naturally. Because authenticity and integrity are very important in leadership. Okay, you can go through one job interview and pretend to be somebody that you're not, but it's going to catch up with you sooner or later. So authenticity um, and an integrity with our personality is the, what we should strive for. Now the way that you're going to answer these eight questions, I can give you a little bit of time after each one to think for yourself, and you can discuss with your neighbour, and if you're very brave you can contribute to the class, because it's kind of personal, this stuff. Okay, and at the end of the evening, I'd like you to have these dimensions a bit clearer in your mind, so you have a picture of yourself. Now, a lot of us haven't even thought about these things yet, perhaps, occasionally, but not very often. Maybe somebody was interviewing you for a job, and they said, what kind of leader do you see yourself as? Because sometimes you get questions like that in an interview, and you might not even thought about it. We're too busy getting on with the job, but if we don't consciously choose the kind of leadership style that we think suits us, we might end up being something we actually don't want to be. At least, let's, but let's not give ourselves a hard time. Let's tonight just try to build more awareness. Then we can reflect on it for our own individual situation. And we're very resilient and very uh, flexible as people, all of us. And we, you may find that the kind of leader you are now is very much a product of your job or your organisation. And in a different job, you could be something quite different. So, I mean, like, for myself, I've had many different kinds of jobs. I mean, I started off um, being in corporate communications, in public, public relations. That was a very different kind of job than being um, a consultant, and being a journalist, and being a professor. So you, you change your style. And if you work for your own business, and, and I worked for myself for many years, for a freelance, then you're a very different style of leader than if you work for an organisation where you've got a boss and you perhaps just do a part of a job, not the whole job. So whatever you are now, don't think, oh my God, I'm going to be like this forever, because that's not necessarily true. It depends, depends on how your career sorts of, you know, um, develops, what you do in the future. And some of you are younger than others, so you'll have even more changes. Any, any questions generally before we start? Okay, you're waiting to see what the eight are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Number one. I call this one. Uh, this is this the, the idea behind this um, this <coughs> leadership concept is trying to answer the question of what kind. Why would I want to be a leader? And do I have a purpose in trying to be a leader? Or am I opportunistic? So, why am I a leader? Is it because I've got some great mission or ideal or something I want to achieve? Or am I just enjoying this responsibility and it's exciting doing this work and I want to be a leader because someone's got to be? And also, I don't want to be led by someone else. I want to be proactive and empowered. But I'm not really sure what kind of leader. So, and you see why they're not... I mean, I can give you examples of positives and negatives of both. 
I'm not saying they are either good or bad. So, if we have a purpose, say like you are absolutely determined to be chief executive of a company with at least um, 2,000 people by the time you are 30. Okay, imagine you're 29 and 364 days. Oh my God, I've only got one day and I'm running out of my goal. Um, some people try very hard to reach a very senior position at a young age. And everything they do is trying to gear towards that. And they may become a little bit manipulative because they want, they manipulate others to try and help them achieve that goal. And some people become disappointed if they don't reach this goal. And they keep applying for senior positions and promotion. And they don't get it, somebody else gets it. And they're devastated because they didn't get their purpose. So that person could become embittered and demoralized because they were very purposive and didn't get to their purpose. But other kinds of leaders with a clear purpose can be very successful. And if you're given a job, like turning a business around, you're know, like um, Jack Welch, famous example, General Electric, he definitely had a purpose, very purposive leader. I want to transform GE. And there's another famous leader who I um, recommend you to read about, uh, Lou Gerstner um, at IBM. He wrote a book, I don't know if you've read it, called Elephants Can Dance. Who said elephants can dance? Elephants can dance. Well, who said elephants Who said it originally? Yeah. You, do you know? Yes. Okay, tell us. No, no, I cannot tell more. more. If he turned around IBM. Yeah, he turned around IBM. And IBM is like an elephant. And everybody said it's too slow. It can't dance. But he was able to turn around that big, famous, iconic company. It was losing market, it was losing a lot of things. It was in a very bad shape. So he was a leader with a purpose. And if you walk into a, a situation like that, a company which is about to, you know, really collapse. Uh, you know, if you don't have a purpose, you're probably not going to achieve anything. So, purposive can be, you know, is it can be a benefit or it can be a drawback. Same with being um, opportunistic. You know, sometimes you might um, think, I'll just go with the flow. You know, I'll just see what jobs are are going. And when I was, I started headhunting when I was working in China. And there were very few headhuntable people in China, this is about 10 years ago, because they speak English, they had no business experience, they had no knowledge of working in a Western style organization. And the Western companies coming into China were desperately headhunting Chinese, especially who could speak English, a little bit of business knowledge and experience. And Chinese are very opportunistic. And when I used to bring them up as a headhunter, they would always say, yes, I'm interested, immediately. And you should see the CDs of some of them. <coughs> Job hopper, big time. <laughs> and some of them would change their, um, you know, not just job title, but the kind of job. You know, they would be um, sales manager <coughs> in a retail one day, and then they'd be, um, maybe production manager in a manufacturing next day, and um, not every day, but some of them change jobs every, well, less than a year, or every, just, just over a year, and would change just for a little bit more money. And this has settled down a bit now as the market has become more mature, and because the economic growth has slowed slightly. But you can be too opportunistic and if your CV looks like a um, uh, you know, Chinese restaurant menu, <laughs> you know, very, very, very long, or a laundry list, you know, in the bright cleaners, then uh, some of the employers might think, oh, too opportunistic. <coughs> but nevertheless, if you don't look out for opportunities, then you're not going to get them. So uh, when I was headhunting, we liked people who were opportunistic. 
to a certain extent, <laughs> because they would listen to us and they were willing to change jobs. And some of our um, clients would say, I don't want somebody who's worked for Shell for 30 years, because they'll never move and they'll never change, because they cut the culture of that Shell organization or you know, a big bank or a ministry is very powerful. So uh, we like opportunistic people. But nevertheless, we like people who had some kind of career path. And a lot of people don't even think about their career path. And while I'm here teaching on the MBA, which starts again tomorrow, I often do some counselling of students on their career path. So let me see your CV. Where is the logic between the, the career moves? So bit of, a bit of purpose, a bit of opportunism. So I'd like you to spend a couple of minutes thinking about, are you a leader with a purpose? Do you have a mission? Or are you quite opportunistic and you're looking for opportunities? Now you might be kind of 60% purpose and 40% opportunity, but think about what is your balance. It's unlikely that, that any of you are 100% like purpose because you might be jobless. You know, I only want to be a brain surgeon and there's no demand right now or something like this. But some of you might be like almost 100% opportunistic because of the nature of the, the market. I can also ask you another question. If you're going to go overseas to another, um, to a job, and you really were very keen on going, getting a job overseas, would you take any job to get a foot in the door? As you know that expression. <laughs> or would you um, say, oh no, no, I couldn't possibly do this job because it's too low and I'm more highly qualified. So how flexible are you? I, when I was just in Maastricht just last week, I met this young man who um, gave a lecture to the MBA class uh, about entrepreneurship. And he was only 26, and he had this grand purpose. He was doing kind of okay. His purpose, he, was, um, he studied medical um, things, and he wanted to be, he was fascinated by replacement body parts. And he showed, when he started his lecture, he showed this little bit scary um, science fiction movie about how they found a bit of a person and managed to sort of make the whole person out of this bit that had been found. Very good. Very futuristic Frankenstein. Yeah. But what he actually did was, it was very clever, he, um, he made, especially to do with your skull, he would make, say like somebody had a head injury, he would make a part of the skull which would be a very special material, but which would not be rejected by your body. And it was all came from um, this young man he met who fell off his bike. And everybody in the Netherlands rides a, a bike. And this, this, this young guy fell off his bike and had a head injury quite badly. And then his brain started to swell inside his skull, which happens if you have a head injury. And I couldn't believe how primitive medical science you know, this is only about five years ago. And, yeah, and they just yeah. chopped up, they made, um, cut pieces of his skull out so the brain could kind of expand. But the horrible bit, I hope you've had dinner already, but the horrible bit was um, they were afraid that the bits of bone taken from the skull would decay. So they opened up his stomach and stuck them in to keep them fresh. <laughs> <laughs> Revolting. Anyway. Um, re, re, there was a word for it, reimplantation of this bone that had been taken out and put in the tummy and put back in again. Reimplantation is 75% a failure. Yeah. So they cut open his stomach, took out his bone, put it back in his head. Failure. A uh, body tried to reject them. And this guy, can you imagine his suffering? About five operations, about four years of suffering. And then this young guy comes along who's made this artificial skull section from like titanium netting or something, very, very clever. And this young guy said to him, if only I'd met you 
you know, four years ago, I wouldn't have had six operations and five years off suffering and no girlfriends and everything else. Because he said he looked like a freak. Because his head was like the surface of the moon. So this young guy is now completely convinced that his purpose is to start a company with this um, artificial bo uh, bone substitute. I could believe that nobody had done it before, actually. I thought that surely someone's done this before and can't be using such old techniques. So very purposive. Okay, I'll probably talk too long about purpose. <laughs> so, uh, an opportunistic. So, let's, um, should we move on to the next one? Does everybody have a think about this? Yes. Okay. Um, are we generalists or experts? Now the question this is all about is, do you have to be an expert in your field to be a leader in your field? Um, are, we, are we sort of generalist leaders and we could be leaders in any kind of organization? Or do we get our leadership uh, comfort zone our ability, our confidence, from our knowledge of a particular technical area. So this is an interesting question. And again, let's come back to our Lou Gerstner and IBM example. If anybody knows anything about Lou Gerstner, what was he doing before he was at IBM? He was, he was not in the computer industry at all. It wasn't cards, but good guess. It was like, um, well, he was a consultant with McKinsey. He was with uh, Financial Services, American Express. He was with um, a food company, Nabisco, biscuits and snacks. And the, the board of IBM came to him and said, you have to come and rescue this American icon. He said, I don't know anything about computers. He said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's being a leader that's the key thing. And for, uh, lots of generalist leaders are consultants. And they advise organizations about leadership matters. It doesn't really matter what kind of organization it is. So think about where your confidence as a leader comes from. Do you feel legitimized in your leadership job because you know about the business that you're in? Computers or banking or medical profession or the legal profession, something like this. And we could also ask ourselves, would it be a good idea to have the leader of a university to be not an academic? Would it be a good idea to have the leader of a hospital, not a doctor? Would it be a good idea to have a leader of a car company who was not like an engineer who could make cars? See, the way things are going, especially when I was in headhunting, we would move people from one industry to another because what we're looking for are particular competencies. And those competencies might be in like building a brand, or building a kind of retail organization. It doesn't matter what it's in. They have a very famous headhunt from Coca Cola, no, from Pepsi Cola, uh, Scully, some kind of now, to Apple. And when we were headhunting, we were very seductive. We would bring people up, and we would try and entice them into a new job. And the headhunter of um, Scully, who I met when I was writing a book about headhunting, he said to this guy working at Pepsi Cola, "Do you want to sell sugared water all your life?" <laughs> or do you want a chance to change the world? If you think about it, Apple has changed the world, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Has Pepsi changed the world? <laughs> well, they a little bit. But Pepsi hasn't really changed that much, has it? The original formula is like um, over 100 years old, the 1870s. Whereas, look at, look at Apple and what they're doing. And it's an amazing company for constant innovation. Just as innovatory now as it was 
wow, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, um, to get back to um, our, our topic, you know, Scully was a generalist leader. He could go from Pepsi to Apple. So think about your CV. Have you, have you moved towards a generalist leadership role? Have you changed the kind of specialist area that you, you were in? There's a, big, there's a big transformation from being an expert leader to a generalist leader. I was interviewing a very senior leader. He was working for BP, British Petroleum. It was before all the problems they had in Mexico and things. And he was saying he started off as a geologist. And many people in BP are chemical engineers and geologists. And he was promoted. And he said he stopped being a geologist, like expert leader, and became a generalist leader. And the big breakthrough for him was when he started to lead people <coughs> whose jobs he didn't understand. So like he, had to, he had to lead people who were IT managers or financial managers or sales and marketing people, and he was a geologist. And he said that was quite scary at first, but then he, of course, he has to trust them. So maybe being a generalist leader needs a lot of trust. It's because a generalist leader needs experts, and the expert leader needs a generalist. Now, often, expert leaders don't get to be very, very senior leaders. And maybe generalist leaders get to be more senior. But not necessarily. So where is our leadership prowess, our leadership ability? What's it rooted in? <coughs> and if, we, if we're most concerned about being specialists and following our specialization, and being comfortable when we're talking about our specialist area and admiring other people who are specialists. On a way, example, about a doctor in, uh, in UK who is a very good, a very good doctor. He specializes in uh, operation of uh, the very little baby, the legs. And he has a very great success in, I think, Namibia or I don't know, in an uh, in, uh, African country. Yeah. Because the people not uh, don't have money to to um, cut the the young uh, people. I mean to to go to the operation. So he's expert in um, um, how can I say in um, fix it the legs of the the young very very little babies in a gyps in in a okay. special form. Yeah, just just to, with with hands and modelize the oh. the baby inexpensive. Legs. Yeah. Unexpensive. Uh, mm. In London, you have a very uh, expensive uh, private mm. clinic, and everybody wants just the operation because it's a uh, it's a fashion. Even uh, mm. it's a very very high price, like uh, seven thousand uh, pounds. And he yeah. said, no, don't operation the baby. I can I can uh, uh, fix it the the little um, uh, uh, legs. And just just have trust in my professional because I fix it the legs of the sandals in okay. Africa not cut the not operation right. oh, no so and how the does that relate to yeah the professional the professional the specialized okay so if we have um, it's all about an example from the developing country where doctors can do special um, operations which are very low price <coughs> and fix things compared with very high price they might charge in a um, yeah, what we're looking at here is if you have a generalist leader of say a hospital or a medical service, they might think out of the box more. Maybe we shouldn't be charging very, very high oh, let me finish. Okay. Very high uh, prices. Uh, maybe we should be more serving more people all around the world, for very low price. Because if you had a, an expert leader who was a, used to charging like loads and loads of money for just one operation and had a small number of very rich clients, they might just carry on being like that. So like expert leaders uh, perpetuate a style 
which relates to their expertise. Whereas a generalist leader could think out of the box and do something quite different. So maybe Apple has got these generalist leaders who have thought beyond just the computer or just a laptop and into um, iPod, um, iPad, and iPhone, and all these other things. Okay, so are you all thinking about whether you're a generalist or a specialist? Okay. Right, we have to keep, keep going. Right. Do we lead from the front and we're very visible? Do we like to be seen by everybody? Or are we a quiet leader? And this whole concept of quiet leadership, how we become comfortable now, is a different way of being a leader. A leader from behind the scenes. Maybe somebody who uh, just getting on with their job, empowering others, uh, doesn't necessarily like to be in the limelight, so to be famous. Let me tell you a little story. Um, we have a company called the Next, a fashion company. Okay, they had um, Next had a leader called George Davis for many years. And he was very flashy, very visible leader. He expanded Next mm -hmm. enormously. And he was always in the media. But he overextended the company so much that he went up. And he was followed by a quiet leader called David Jones, and this guy was very quiet in his style of leadership. He was a accountant by background, and he started uh, at a very low level. He worked himself up from just working in the mail room of the company, and he had a very different style, not so flamboyant, not so visible behind the scenes. And it was only when he was tired but it was revealed why he was like this. And it was because for many, many years, he had a very unpleasant disease called Parkinson's. He's heard of this. And you kind of get twitchy, and you sometimes have good days and bad days, it's completely incurable. And you have to take a lot of medications to go. And some people are worse than others. Anyway, he was kind of up and down. But he would I put on his alarm for five in the morning to start taking medication so that by kind of eight o'clock he could go to work. And um, we both had to talk to by the same publisher. We were sharing a platform at a conference. And um, he was having quite a good day and he presented very well. The next day I saw him at the airport, he was having a very bad day. And the reason why he was a quiet leader was because he never wanted to be on TV. He never wanted to be met by journalists because he was afraid he might have a fear. And he wanted to hide it from everybody in the company and the media because he thought that they might lose confidence in him as a leader if they knew he had this very debilitating illness. And, you know, it's quite an effort to hide something like that for a long time. And he was tired then. He kind of came out of the closet. And now they've got fundraising for the charity associated with this. But like it was a quiet style. And that was because of his particular situation. But some people have a quieter personality, more introvert. And also they like to empower others. Okay. And the view of leadership now is it doesn't have to be very visible and showy. And also, if you have trust, you don't have to be seen all the time to be watching everybody. Yeah. communication but wouldn't be walking around the office all the time and wouldn't be seen by everybody it's really to do with the um, visibility so you want to be seen as being the leader I mean some people think they have to be the first into the company every morning 
they have to be seen to be walking around and see what people are doing. They, um, they want to be the spokesperson for the company in the media. They want to personify the company. But that's only one way of being a leader. So you could be kind of leading behind the scenes and giving lots of other people the opportunity to be a spokesperson or to represent the company. And, to, and as a result, you might actually grow the <coughs> people in the company more. So that's a possibility. So we're looking at different personalities and different leadership styles. example, Steve Jobs, in terms of uh, visibility and the behind the scenes ability to Well, he's kind of stepped down, hasn't he, in some ways. He's brought other people up. And he's a bit nerdy at times, so, yeah, he's probably quite quiet. And the same with that guy in the um, um, social networking in Facebook. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a nerdy kind of person, you know, you're a computer geek, you know, uh, perhaps you're not that good at public speaking or not that good at management. Actually, they're not good at management because they're good at what they do. So then they're more of a quiet kind of leader. But they're still leaders because they're very influential. The, the example in, of the doctor who I mentioned, yeah. uh, he wants to, to share his experience uh, step by step with uh, each person who wants from that uh, country in Africa and teach everything what he knows about the specialists in this area in, in medical but uh, it is a, a kind of um, a quiet leader quiet leader yeah, because yeah. he don't have the power to, to speak in London he will answer why you don't say this miracle what you do here in Africa why you don't try to speak in London and he said, come on, I don't have this power. Here, yeah. the people follow me. And I want to see everybody, my uh, work results. Okay, let me explain to the others, because they probably can't mm -hmm. hear you. Um, we're, we're talking about this, this person, this, um, very famous, this, this doctor who's working in Africa, and who's doing some revolutionary, low-cost low operations to really help a lot of people. And he's not um, beating his drum. You know, he's not shouting about it. Uh, and he, people are saying to him, why don't you talk more about what you do? And he, but he would rather quietly just get on with it. But you can imagine um, in an organization you might have somebody who does the, the talk and somebody who does the, the doing. So you could have a leader who is visible and a leader who is invisible, maybe in the same organization. You don't know what we're good at. You see, some people are very good at talking and presenting, and um, they can always get a new job, they can raise financing, but actually their, their content might not be so good as the guy who's very quietly behind the scenes. So sometimes if you're a behind the scenes kind of quiet leader type, you actually might need the visible person to carry out some kind of role for you. So again, it can be like a, a combination. Um, with um, again, the Richard Branson example, Richard Branson's a very visible leader. He likes to be seen all the time. And he thinks also his behavior is good for the company because it keeps, it keeps the company in everybody's uh, mindset. But he's not really doing all the work of running the company. It's much too big now, much too diverse, so he'd have lots and lots of managers. Quite new. 
we've only been really talking about this over the last half decade or so, especially with this concept of stress in the workplace. And this idea now that uh, a successful manager maybe shouldn't be obsessive. They should have a balanced life. And, well, even uh, Jack Welch, if you need, he, um, he had a scratch handicap of golf. And he would get that with them playing once a year. So obviously he would have kept in his golf. And other leaders take time out. Have you heard of a leader who uh, takes a year off and sails around the world? Or spends a year working in uh, a voluntary organisation? And maybe make them more balanced. So, it's some people think that I should be very focused on my job, because that's the way to become promoted, that's the way to be successful. Other people are more thinking about, perhaps I should have other, other things in my life. And that might be good for my job as a leader. Yeah, balance the health. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, but I'm um, hoping you've heard of, you've heard of Ryanair, the low-cost mm -hmm. Irish airline. Mm -hmm. In fact, they used um, Romanian planes and pilots when they got started. They had a pad on. Yeah. And there is this guy called uh, Michael O'Leary, who runs Ryanair. And he's really obsessive. He was there at work at 6 o'clock in the morning, the first flight that's going out, he's still there at 10 o'clock at night. Um, you know, he um, didn't get married at that point, he still doesn't even get married now. He was married for a long time, you know, he's, he's, the company was everything. And is this uh, good for everybody? You know, is this um, productive? So the whole idea is good. In fact, we could talk about it. Yeah, but he, he's got this obsessive style. Other people are much more seeing um, the, the job as something you do working hours, but you have some, you have other things that you do. Yeah. to reach middle management level, the others went up to CEO level. They wanted to uh, see what were the differentiators between the two, the two groups. And uh, they realized it was their, basically their attitude towards life. Uh, for example, the uh, example that I uh, got stuck in my mind was the people who only reached middle management said, uh, it was a good thing that I got married, so that because my wife managed the kids, I didn't have, I always had a clean shirt, I always had a, a hot meal on the table. And the, uh, the guys who reached CEO level said, uh, getting married was the best thing in my life. My, uh, my wife always uh, gives me the best advice, uh, she helped me change the view of life, and I always consult her when I make the uh, important decisions. So it was the balance in the life. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everybody heard her comment? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's another element that's also coming out of what you were saying, which is feedback. And does the leader have feedback from someone? Yeah, you might be doing the wrong thing, but nobody, but you're not listening to anybody. It doesn't have to be a wife, it could be a friend or, you know, any, or anyone. But it's this idea of um, listening to feedback is also part of balance. Because if you're um, very, very driven, very, very focused, maybe you don't stop and think, am I doing the most suitable, appropriate thing? And maybe do, do, I, do I listen? Which may not be. You know, some people don't um, listen. Oh, and then they're so... Um, obsessive about their job. Now there's a very important distinction between being passionate and being obsessive. <coughs> Do you have a little an idea of the difference? So obsessive is can get a bit negative. And they become self-consuming. 
Whereas passion is something you share with others. And this young guy who, was, who did the skull transplant things, the lecture I went to just a couple of days ago, he started off his lecture by showing pictures of himself. Uh, and he was salsa dancing. And he was uh, climbing a mountain. And things like this. And he thought it was good to show passion. And not just passion for his skull transplants, but passion for life. And he said, I want to do this job because I want to be happy. And I'll be happy if I achieve this. And he, he said, I want to make other people happy, like the guy who fell off his bike and, you know, and lost his girlfriends and everything because he looked so awful and suffered so much. He says, I want to make people happy. I want to be happy too. So that's kind of balance. Now, some of us actually nearly um, kill ourselves with overwork and have a nervous breakdown and then are forced by a doctor to be more balanced. And that, that does happen. I remember um, reading about a Japanese guy. Japanese work very, very hard and they're very, very focused. And his job was to, um, oh, he was a liquidator. You know, companies that went bankrupt, he would go there and uh, liquidate all their assets. And it was a very horrible job. Because everybody, you know, everybody met was so upset because the business had gone bust. And and he had a nervous breakdown because his job was so horrible, really. And then when he got over this nervous breakdown, he decided to start up a, a chain of restaurants. He said, running a restaurant is such a nice thing because people come, they have a nice meal, they're happy. He says, I bring happiness to people through nice food. Great. Yeah, there is a movie with the uh, up in the air, the mission was to go in the companies and fire everybody. And the MVP had a conversation. The three powerful ones inside. Oh, it's eating away you inside, that kind of job. Yeah. Okay, so work-life balance, we're thinking about. Okay, let's carry on. Okay. Do we see ourselves as participated leaders? Do we like to get other people's <coughs> comments and ideas? Or do we make decisions by ourselves? So people who um, are participated leaders, sometimes it can be in a positive way. I would like all my members of my team to help me solve my problems. Sometimes it can be negative. I had a leader one who, um, she didn't want to make any decisions. She was there all the time, asking other people what they thought. Now that was quite nice, we were asked what we thought, but in the end, decisions were not made. And she, she would try to encourage the people whose opinion she was speaking to make a decision for her. So it was like avoiding leadership. So participation, as a leader, depends on your particular job, but you may have to still make an overall decision, which might be based on a consensus of many people, but you say, okay, most of us think that we should do this, so let's do it. Rather than an authori authoritative approach of being a one single decision maker. Now, some people like an authoritative leader because they don't want to make a decision because it might be the wrong one and they get into trouble and lose their job. So you see, you can't be a participative leader in an organization which is used to authoritarian leadership. Because if you say to somebody, you decide what we're doing. Oh, no, 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 not me. I never did that before. <laughs> it's scary. So you see, it's very situational, lots of these leadership styles. So participative leadership works where you have high level of motivation and ability amongst people. And if you know some of your leadership theory, this is like um, situational leadership, Hershey Blanchard, I've not talked about before. This is a very famous kind of polar opposite in leadership, <coughs> team-based or authoritative. Now, in some jobs like in, in the army, you know, in, in a wartime situation. Okay, the uh, commander-in-chief doesn't go to all the soldiers and say, what do you think, you know, we should do about <laughs> it? Because it kind of wouldn't work. 
And also these soldiers are trained to obey orders. But say like you're in a law firm or in a PR agency or in a you know a university or something, you, you can't necessarily have this kind of leadership because people feel, well, you know, I've got an opinion about this. And I want to get involved in what's being done. So what do you think? Depends on the situation. Because you can't be all the time participating. But then, if you think about who really knows what's going on in an organisation, it's often the more junior people. And uh, one friend of mine was doing a renovation of a hotel. He was a project manager, and he was asking the hotel cleaners, "What do you, do you think we should have a carpet or tiles?" And his bosses were saying, "Why are you asking them?" They're just the cleaners. He said, oh, they know. Because also, if the carpet pile is too high, then they can't hoover under the bed. So all the gunge and dust builds up under the bed. And the people who were designing the hotel rooms never thought of that, because they don't clean them. <laughs> so if ever you're in a situation where you, you know, like, um, where something is completely wrong, you know, like everything's been designed wrongly, it's probably designed by somebody who never actually uses that thing. And if they actually ask somebody who does use it, then they <laughs> might get some feedback which just might help them to do a better job. So it does depend on the situation. Yeah. I think from an ethical point of view, even in wars and in very author authoritative uh, places, people should have the ability to make their own decisions because in wars, they get to massacres and bad st things because no soldier has the courage to say, say no to the command. And I think everyone, everybody should at least know uh, how to lead. Even so to understand the situation and be able to take a decision, even if in armies. So everybody should participate in the process? No, no, process. not participate, but at least know it and understand the situation. Yeah, do you agree to that? So even the, the lead should understand the process of leadership and what's going on. And no. But then but that's, that's more linked to, to, to communication than to no. decision yeah. making. Yeah, but the role of the leader being a communicator, I think that comes back to some of the points we had earlier about what kind of leader we want for our own country. Yeah, I'd like to think about teams where they switch from time to time. Self-managing teams, we've done some studies of this. We've had MBA students who've made a, a thesis on self-managing teams. Unfortunately, um, let's be practical, and it doesn't really matter what I think, it's what works or doesn't. And these self-managing teams often don't work. Or they work up to a point. Or they work in an environment where um, there's a very big growth of business. But in a downturn, they're not quite so successful. Rotation of the leader, yeah. Or people take it in turns, or um, the leadership choices are made by the whole group. Um, it sounds great, but we're living in the real world and we have to think about what might work. And culturally, I'm going to be teaching culture from tomorrow onward. And this power distance concept, many of you might know about. High power distance is where people tolerate authority uh, high above them, telling everybody what to do without question. Low power distance where, is where there's much less of a gap between senior and junior people, and there's a much, a much flatter organization style. So national culture also impacts on this kind of uh, debate that we've got between participative and authoritarian leadership. Yeah. Can I ask you what works uh, in a special team, which is the form of a big corporation? Does it work consensus or, uh, more like uh, agreeing on stuff, or should it be better that uh, the CEO has one and a half step above the others? Mm -hmm. um, Did everybody hear this? 
Um, like what happens in a board of directors or what should happen? Should everybody participate or should the CEO take the decisions? Well, again, there's kind of no right or wrong. It's situational. Um, seems to me like a board should be collective, but then some of the people on the board might not want to make disturbances. I mean, say like you're a non-executive director, you've got a nice position on the board, you might not agree with what's going on, but you might think, oh, I think I'd like to keep this position, it's rather nice, and go along with it. So some groups become very cohesive, and they don't rock the boat. Maybe ideally, we should have more challenges. If we challenge leaders more often, we might have a more productive result. But then, you've got to have a lot of courage to do challenges. You know, like being a whistleblower. We've all heard of this concept. You know, somebody who's willing to say, oh, what we're doing is illegal. <laughs> you know, we should be doing this. And there's all kinds of pressure on people not to say these things because Unless you have protection as a whistleblower, you could lose your job. You know the, the woman on the, in the FBI who blew the whistle on her colleagues after September 11th uh, because she said the FBI knew all about the September 11th, um, you know, this, this, the plot, okay. if you like, or the, the, the initiative or whatever they were doing. And they didn't say anything. And she made this big report and leaked it and she said, I could not sleep at night worrying that there was a scandal. So that was a very powerful thing she did, but she probably won't ever work again. So you have to have courage to kind of join in this participative process. And you have an easier life if you have an authoritarian leader and you just go with the flow. But then we end up with people, um, these nasty leaders that we were talking about at the beginning of the workshop. Because what, what's the definition? Um, the presence of evil just requires uh, honest people to do nothing. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, participation is our imperative. We should participate to keep leaders honest, to stop them from getting power mad. It's our obligation. Okay, let's carry on. Okay, we're getting towards the end of our eight questions. <laughs> uh, <coughs> leaders and managers, I had this question at the beginning. We were just chatting at the beginning of the, um, the evening. The difference between leadership and management. It's a very much discussed topic. We talk about leaders having vision and mission and seeing the big picture. And we see about managers having, you know, implementing. You, you might know um, the quotation, um, thinking without action is a daydream. Action without thinking is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we might say the uh, managers are acting a lot. And they need to think and plan and have a mission the vision. They need a leader. The leader, um, if he's just thinking all the time and thinking great ideas, but not implementing, that's not going to work either. Daydreaming. So, people like Minsberg, I mentioned at the beginning, was thinking along the lines that we should have a combination of leadership and management in a successful leader. Who can manage? Can be a manager without being a leader? The other one, no. Um, well, if, you, um, if you're a leader without being a manager, you've got all kinds of great ideas that don't come to anything. If you're a manager without being a leader, you're kind of doing the daily job, but you might be going nowhere. But if you're a real leader, even if you're not a good manager, you can inspire others to be. You could say that. So a leader needs managers. Manager needs a leader. Many organisations, perhaps here in Romania as well, are too much focused on management and don't have a goal or a mission. Maybe the whole country, we believe some of your comments. It's very easy to get sucked into the daily grind. Just do more of the same. But if there's nobody saying is the same, what we should be doing or not, then 
that we can, if we have this division. Now, some people think that being a leader is fashionable and has status is, and is attractive, because being a manager is boring. But if we think like too much like that, then we're going to miss out some important elements within the process. And like in the Arab countries where I do a lot of teaching, people all want to be leaders, they don't want to be a manager. Or they, the Arab guys are the leaders and the managers are the expatriates. Many of them might be Indian or Pakistani and they're brought in to do this work. But of course, the leaders don't actually know what's going on. And some of them are quite cleverly manipulated by the managers without even noticing. So if you regard yourself as a leader, but then you don't know how to implement, then you might think of things which are not appropriate. Or they're too high in the sky and they're not down on the ground. But if you're too down on the ground, you don't see above. So think about which one you think you have a leaning towards. And if you have both big picture thinking and the ability to implement, then we've got quite an exciting combination there. Because you can be realistic and you can be practical, but you can also be a little bit visionary. It's quite hard to have in one person. And even when you're writing a book, you know, like in this leadership mm -hmm. key concepts, my co-author, Jonathan, had lots of the ideas. But, you know, I sit down and do a lot of the writing. So, you know, you can have all these ideas and no book. Or you can have the ability to write a book but no ideas. You've got to have a combination. So you've got to have the ideas to start a company, like the young guy with his skull cast on. But you've also got, he's got to find investors, he's got to hire a manager. It's just him at the moment, so he's got a long way to go to make it really work. But we hope that his vision and his ideas can still continue. Because if something becomes very management oriented, it kind of runs out of all the ideas. Okay, so this is another balance. Okay, we're getting towards the Okay, this is another big leadership question. Do you have to be truly inspirational and charismatic to be a leader? Or can you just be ordinary? I think the answer is we, we can just be ordinary and be a leader. <coughs> we don't have enough leaders. And we can be kind of ordinary but enthusiastic and believe in what we do. We might not be you know, very uh, able to inspire everybody to get very, very excited, but we can still try to infect people with some basic enthusiasm. And also, if you try to be inspirational and you're not, it just looks so fake, doesn't it? I mean, this is definitely, when people say leaders are born and not made, the inspirational leaders are probably born, but they're hard to make. But we can all, we can all be ourselves. And be a leader. People like Branson, very inspirational. You know, we've got things like flying hot air balloons and um, you know, does crazy things with sun to get people to notice about clergy. Uh, but most of the people doing the work in that organisation are probably quite ordinary. So authentically, working with others, getting on with their job, even like, even like your doctor guy. He's probably not that charismatic, he's just busy doing mm -hmm. his doctor work. Because in his charisma, it is the same as we talked about at the beginning. You know, Hitler, um, Saddam Hussein, you know, Gaddafi, they regard themselves as charismatic. And they have things that they are to a certain extent. And Hitler, don't forget, was voted in in a democratic way. <laughs> Or it just never got corrupted. 
because you can be charismatic for good and then sort of it just this power that you get from charisma becomes you know something you can't control yeah it sort of goes around and comes back on you although if you can stop if you have the power to stop the power to stop i'm thinking of the rasputin the rasputin rasputin yeah. mm. um, charismatic people uh, man a person who have a lot of success at the uh, royal uh, yeah i mean and he couldn't just stop doing it yeah well that's the sorry now for Russia. yeah a lot of influence. Everybody know the story of um, this, um, Rasputin and the Tsar, the last Tsar of Russia, yeah. and he could he could cure the the young guy who was um, had the bleeding, the hemophilia. He could he could be the Tsar successor was had a very uh, this bad disease where he bleed very easily, and Rasputin could, was could fix it. So the Tsarina really believed in him. Yeah, I mean, maybe if you've got some kind of special powers, which is associated with charisma, but you know, everybody can stop. Mm. Sometimes it's, it's, yeah, it's a quite a challenge there. He tried a new experience about uh, sex and about the, the poison in his, uh, he, he's poisoned Himself. his body, yeah, his body. And he, he tried to, to be uh, in server, uh, the god, with a lot of uh, prostitution and sex and uh, drinking and uh, she try a new experience with I suppose if you um, if you think you're a god you know like Alexander you know you can't just suddenly say oh I'm not a god anymore <laughs> it would be a bit unconvincing yeah so this but it's obsessive isn't it I mean this is kind of getting to be more healthy it's a joke we cannot quit <laughs> god can't quit okay well I think we kind of know whether we are or not on this one Let's go to our last one. Okay. <clears throat> this is about legacy. What we leave behind us. Do we think about this? Do we do things for what people might say afterward? So like, like a lot of people wondered why uh, Tony Blair uh, joined America to go to war in Iraq. And all, people thought, all he wants to do is to build a legacy for himself. And write huge big books, you know, Blair and leadership. And he wanted to be famous, and he wanted to create this, this fame, this legacy would go on and on. But other people just do their daily job. And have you ever thought, you know, like, are your retirement speech? Okay, you're too young. At some point in your life, you're going to retire from a job, or quit a job, or leave. You have a leaving party or something, and some person might say, "We're very sorry to lose, um, you know, our colleague, because what did she do for us? She did what? So have you thought about what might be said about you?" Sounds like obituary. Obituary? Yeah, well that's the, the extreme of this. What you have on your gravestone. I don't want you to, I don't want to be morbid. <laughs> but, you know, some people are thinking through about all this stuff all the time. And they want to sort of leave this aura behind them. I mean, it can be um, a positive thing. If we think about, you know, lots of um, you know, these diseases, we're talking about medical stuff all quite a lot for some reason, they're named after some inventor or of this disease. Or um, people who, who in, you know, like in shipping, in the shipping industry, we, um, this guy called Plimsoll, he invented the, the Plimsoll line. So it's a mark on the ship. So when it's uh, too full of cargo, it might sink. You can notice. So people gave their name to things. Now you might say, did they have a plan to put their name to that thing? Or did it just happen? And do we ever want, do we, are we trying to be remembered for a particular thing? Or not? Or are we just, uh, just doing our job and trying to do the best we can? And, you know, like perhaps when we quit a job or something, somebody says, 
oh, she worked very hard and she was very nice to everybody. Oh, good enough. So have we thought through this legacy issue? things to think about. We, there's four options running out of time. Yeah, we can finish in a few minutes. Okay, so I, I hope you've all got some kind of idea of the kind of reader that you might be. You know, like, um, you know, I'm kind of here and now, really. I'm focusing on what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm just an ordinary person trying to do my job. Um, I'm mostly a manager, but a little bit of leader. I like to make decisions in the team. I like to share. I like to have some kind of balance in my my life. You know, cured workaholic. <laughs> Maybe been workaholic before I've become cured. <laughs> Do I like to be seen in my leadership role? Or I'm just quite happy that other people take on the job and are seen to be leading sometimes. Am I just comfortable in my expertise, or if I do something else, I find it quite scary? Or am I, am I opportunistic? Or do I have a big purpose? We're kind of going back to full circle now, because purposive is often somebody who wants a legacy. And opportunistic is often somebody who's kind of in the here and now. something behind you, um, <coughs> the chief in that vision would perhaps be your legacy. But the vision might be for the whole organisation and your role might just be as an implementer. Okay. So, what kind of leader are you? The best. The best. <laughs> oh, but the best in which situation? In which context? And now, and not later. Because the kind of leader that you'll be five years from now, now may be quite different from the leader that you are now. Uh, are you the kind of leader you want to be? If you're very honest, you might say, I wish I wasn't so bossy and controlling. I wish I could trust other people, but you know you can't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear this again and again when we're doing our leadership classes. So listen to yourself speaking sometimes see what that tells about you. Okay. So I hope it's given you some food for thought. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll make these extracts from the book and I'll send them to you so you can read again and refresh your memory about this. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to share all this with you. Thank you.